Hey guys, it's Dan. Welcome back. I've got, uh, actually I've got a pretty major painting project that I'm like 90% done with, which are some, I call them, I guess, late dark age Saxon models. Um, but yeah, the, the final piece of it's just kind of a grind, so I've been procrastinating. But uh, I have a couple of smaller remediation projects, call them, uh, where I have finished units, like the one sitting in front of you, that either need some touch-up work done, or in this particular case, I need to paint one more model. I have a unit of 49 and I need 50. So uh, I thought it would give me an opportunity to put together some quicker painting content for you and simultaneously showcase some of this painted stuff. So what you're looking at, this is actually a kit-bashed combination of Perry Miniatures and War Games Atlantic that I've painted up to be, call them like conquistadors, you know, um, 16th century Spanish. Um, as I keep saying, I use them predominantly for fantasy wargaming, so there's always a fantastical twist to it. Um, but I'll, I'll properly showcase this model at the end, but the kind of the progression of this video is going to be that I want to isolate a couple of miniatures just to show you some of the kit bash potential here. Um, I'm going to speed paint the one figure that I need to finish for this unit, and then at the very end, I'll uh, give them a turn on the old Lazy Susan so you can see the finished unit properly. So let me cut here. So in showing some of the kit bash potential here, I wanted to break the unit up. There's really four categories of conversion, call it. Um, so on the left-hand side, we've got a pair of models that are from the Perry Mercenaries box. And the distinction between that and this group, which is from their Bows and Bills box, is that these are the ones that come with the pike arms in the upright position. And I had mentioned in my prior Perry video that that kit actually comes with conversion bits to turn those pikes into pole arms. So that's what I've done for the back two ranks of this unit as I've taken models from the mercenary kit, converted them into the halberdiers, if you like. Uh, these two here are also Perry miniature bodies and the arms are from the bows and the bills kit. Uh, so in fact, some of these bodies might be swip swapped between them, but the arms are from the bows and the bills kit because those ones, all of the bills in that are at an at port position or like close to an upright position. Um, speaking of Perry miniatures, on the far right hand side, these are actually metal models from Perry, just from a couple of blister packs that I picked up. I think there's like eight metal models in this unit that have no conversion work done whatsoever. They just have out of the box or out of the blister metal models painted up like that. And then these two, um, the halberd there is covering up the face, are <coughs> actually out of the box. War Games Atlantic Conquistadors. About, I don't know, maybe 12 models in this unit are just War Games Atlantic Conquistador bodies. And you can see, if I take the metal ones aside for a second, and I take the kind of redundant mercenary ones aside, you can see that in terms of scale, the War Games Atlantic Conquistadors and the Perry miniatures blend together very nicely. Now, I should also note that the heads, almost all of the heads in this unit, other than the metal models, are from the Conquistadors box. And I'm actually gonna put a link in the description to uh, the Rusted Brush that are really thorough and I think fantastic review of the Conquistadors box that details just how many bits come in that set. Um, so yeah, just from a couple of sprues, uh, I got enough heads to do an entire unit of kit bashed Perry miniatures and some War Games Atlantic guys as well. So. Um, just a note there, but really what we're comparing here are bodies and body sizes. And you can see that they are pretty darn close. I would say that the War Games Atlantic guys are a little bit stockier. Again, Perry Miniatures on the left, War Games Atlantic on the right. However, aside from the fact that they look a little bit more built, part of that, of course, too, is that they have poofy sleeves, you know, pantaloons, whereas the Perry guys have more of your skin-tight tunics. Uh, on the left hand side here so very comfortable in terms of scale and styling and critically i think that the heads again these are out of the box war games atlantic heads on the perry models on the left hand side here and i think that they blend together really nicely and actually in fact speaking of conversion work just generally talking about scale between various sets um, this one which i use as a unit champion is actually uh this is a warlord games body 
The torso is from the Lance Connect kit. The arms are from the Perry Footnight box. And the head is from the War Games Atlantic Conquistador set. And you can tell even just at a glance that the Warlord set is the this Warlord set is the smallest of the group because the Eda Champion there is a little bit smaller in stature than the other ones. Um, however, aside from that, they're they're all roughly the same size and scale. So um, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to cut to some speed paint footage of this guy that I need to paint up to make a full complement of 50 models. Um, and I'll do some voiceover there just kind of explaining what I'm doing. But uh, this unit was really fast to paint up, despite being yellow and red. Yellow being a notoriously labor-intensive color to paint normally, because they were painted uh, almost entirely with contrast paints. So I'll show you a little bit of what I do there, and then I'll show you the finished unit at the end. And we're off here. You know, honestly, looking back on this, there's something kind of refreshing about painting just one model at a time. I'm so used to painting, you know, big batches of 20. This was kind of relaxing. Uh, so I don't even remember base coating this model. I mean, I must have had this model for five years, something like that, because I've never used gray primer. I think this is black primer, and I must have dry brushed gray over it at some point. Um, so what I'm doing, though, is I'm going in and painting the areas that I'm gonna use contrast paint on in white. I didn't feel like just repriming the entire model or busting out a can of primer for a single miniature. So I'm just going through and doing a, a solid application of white on the miniature. And then I'm gonna let that dry for a second and um, kind of paint some other areas so that I can then come in and do the contrast paint work. I'm using, uh, this is, iron breaker from citadel that metal color and i mentioned in the prior video that i've been trying to branch out to different manufacturers for paint and the one area where i just seem to can't get away from games workshop is metallics i've always found with rare exceptions there's a couple of metallic paints from them that i don't like at all um, but i find that citadel metallics i have not been able to find anybody that does them better yet so if anybody has any recommendations please throw them in the comments there and uh, that'll be something I pick up on my next trip to the hobby store. So this model actually had a, a lot of metal on them. And I hop back and forth, even within a single unit, I'll use different shades of uh, metal. I'll use, like, Iron Breaker, Lead Belcher. Um, I do have some, like, Army Painter metallics that are decent. So I'll blend those in sometimes, too, just to have a, a gradient of color for my metallics. But what I'm using in this case is just Citadel Iron Breaker across the model. And then, yeah, like I said, lots of metal bits on this guy. Just generally going through. Again, even painting one model, it's, it's funny that you have all this time to stare at one miniature and have to consider things like dry times on different areas. So it was kind of fun painting this way for a change. So I've got two contrast paints. I've actually got a small collection of contrast paints, um, usually that I pick up with a project in mind that I want to try it out with. And um, I have the color I'm using there is the yellow one, which is Ayindan yellow. And I think it really <clears throat> turns out good. What, what I end up doing at the end of this, as I showed in my like dipping video from a few years back, is I end up doing a, like a dry brush and a wash at the end of this. And I still do that even though these are contrast paints because my painting style is kind of gritty and dirty and the contrast paints, while they look cool once done, um, I usually, I more use them for just like a solid foundation color application. They're kind of rewarding to paint too over white because the immediately as soon as you paint over it, it's just such a, a solid hue of whatever color that you're painting that it's... um. Yeah, it's just kind of rewarding, and there you go. They dry decently fast, too. Um, just another thing to note, but I find, especially for yellow, I don't, I really don't think I'm going to paint yellow any other way. Um, this is my, this is Zandri Dust. This is another color of Games Workshops that I'll struggle to get away from, because I use this for my wood grain for everything, like a bow, back of a shield, weapons. And so that's what I'm going through here, and just painting the shaft of the halberd there. So once I'm done with the blocking out color step and this is one of the videos i have um kind of teed up to do is a updated version of my 
dry brush dipping method because there are some, I think, very good, fair questions that were asked in the comments section of that very first video I put out on this channel that went over my army painter dip method and that I think warrants some answers. And the best way to do that, I think, is with a, a video kind of showing you why I do this like dry brush step before I uh, dip or wash the model. But that's what we're working toward here, just blocking out a couple of colors. I use um, different shades of brown for leather. Right now I'm painting Rhine Oxide on the feet. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll use the Doombull Brown as well as kind of like a reddish leather color for things like belt straps. Sometimes I'll come in with um, Steel Legion, Legion Drab as a, more of a, like a beige color. And I just find that the variety, even on a single model, adds a lot of, um, I don't know, realism, authenticity to it, because uh, it, it would be unusual for a, a soldier to have you know, six different items that all have the exact same color leather. Painting the straps on the back of the legs there. I actually switched the brush out. I don't know if you guys noticed. I had a larger, like, Army Painter standard brush that I was using for all the other colors. And I've uh, picked up a detail brush because size. <laughs> some of these Perry miniature details are very small. Belts and buckles and stuff like that. Another AK acrylic color. And uh, this is a skin tone that I got from them that I really like. It's got a great coverage on it. Skin colors in addition to the leather is another thing that I'll vary up within a unit. Um, I have army... Actually, that's one kind of paint that I feel that Citadel does not have a good variety of, good range of, is skin tones. So that was one of the reasons I started branching out on skin tones from the get, was because I didn't think Citadel had a great selection. So this is AK Acrylics. Uh, what is this called? This is AK Acrylics Basic Skin Tone. So it's really it's got good coverage. And sometimes I'll blend in like Army Painter, Barbarian Flesh. Um, I've actually got, believe it or not, I've got a P3 paint from War Machine. I doubt they even make this stuff anymore. Rin Flesh is another one that I use. So it gives a good variety of, of skin tones and colors, different brightnesses which I think adds some nice visual interest to a unit. And again, because I predominantly use these models for fantasy gaming, I tend to come in with gold as an accent color on just about everything that I paint for things like belt buckles and some riveting here and there. Um, not because it would be historically accurate for an infantryman to have gold anything, um, but because I like the contrast of color. I think it looks neat. And I use, that's the uh, Citadel Retributor Armor, which is probably one of the best metallic colors I think I've ever dealt with. And then back to the point about, like, considering dry times for a single miniature. I don't normally do it this way. I'll usually do my dry brush wash step before I'll even think about the base. Um, but because I was waiting for a couple of sections on this model to fully dry before I could go through and do my dry brush step, I thought, you know, why don't we just go through and do a base color on the, the base. So this is a Walmart color that I use called Territorial Beige. It's from their Apple Barrel range, which is nice for base work because you don't need the pigment count to be very high. And it's cheap. In the, here in the U.S., it's like 50 cents for a, a big bottle. Yeah, it's yeah, two fluid ounces, 59 mil. So it's a lot of paint, which is good for basing work. So we're into the dry brush stage here. And again, I'm going to do a separate video kind of detailing why I do this, and I think the best way to, to demonstrate that would be have <clears throat> some models that I don't do this on, and then some models that I do, so you can contrast the finished product. Um, but yeah, I'll dry brush a bright silver, silver color for the metal pieces, and then I'll come through with just pure white with a very, very light dry brush um, to pick up some of the raised areas, and then I'll take a detail brush to do a couple of dot highlights on the very highest points. And what that does is it all kind of washes out when you come through with what is functionally devil in mud. Um, but it kind of pre-highlights the model. And um, so it looks a little goofy at this stage because it's getting taken up to a very extreme highlight. But I have found that it looks pretty cool once it's done. So yeah, I'm, I'm going through the detail brush. These models actually have a lot of points to pick out, especially on the sleeves. You can see there, it's, it's unusual that I have that many highlights to place. But that's what I'm going through. Anything that would 
seem like an extreme highlight or a, a very raised up area. Would get just a little tiny, tiny dot of white with my detail brush there. It's the same thing on the left arm there. And then on the calves, some of the backs there. This is something that just takes a lot of practice if it's something that you want to do because, as I said, it, it doesn't feel natural at this stage because you're taking these highlights up to such a high level. So it, it won't look right until it's washed and dried and there's matte varnish on it. So now we're at the wash stage, and I had for the longest time been using Army Painter Quick Shade, and I do prefer that to this kind of wash that I've come up with because it, it really does behave differently. It's oil-based instead of water-based. Um, so I think that the, the pigment, the flow, the end product, it's a subtle difference. Like I don't know that many people would see the difference, but I, I notice it on my own models anyway. Um, so I prefer Army Painter Quick Shade. Um, however, it's, it's pretty time intensive to break it out. You usually ruin a brush in the process, so it's not worth doing um, unless you have a large unit to do because I use a brush on method instead of a proper dip method, um, both to reduce waste and um, because it gives me a lot better control. Um, but this, especially for a single model, it's just much faster. This is a mix of, it's like Agrex Earthshade, there's Seraphim Sepia in it, and there is some Army Painter Strong Tone and Soft Tone, but it's not from the can, it's from their um, dropper bottles. So again, water-based, not oil-based. So we, what you can see, it's just a super heavy wash that I put over this model, again, to try to mellow out some of those bright highlights that I did. And I even do this over the areas that I painted with contrast paint and then kind of wick off any of the areas that have too much pooling, what have you. And then here we go. On to the Lazy Susan we go. Here's the finished unit in all of its glory. You can see my high-tech spinning method going on there. I've even upgraded it to where it's got a proper like white base on the uh, turntable there. So there you go. So I've got, again, a couple other small column cleanup projects that I want to do that would have a, a accompanying video with it. I've got a larger painting project to do. And then... Uh, couple other ideas that I've got in mind for the near future here. So appreciate you guys stopping by. Thanks for hanging out. And until next time, happy gaming, guys.